Hello, everybody, and welcome to another deep dive video here on the channel, specifically for a brief overview of the Western state of the fantasy genre and how the recent centuries have led into its current state. Note, this will not be like a deep dive all the way back into like sitting around the fire Ooga Booga cave times. No, 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 no. I'm gonna be looking at actual genres of writing that slowly changed and evolved into being the modern state of fantasy we see today and make a slight case that what we've actually seen is like sometimes just talk about like, oh, this subgenre is gone. When in reality, they've just kind of been relabeled by publishing houses and now they're just kind of known as something else. But before we get into that, let's go ahead and jump backwards in time. Not all the way back to like campfire stuff, but just, you know, a few thousand years. Let's, let's venture forth. First, what I want to touch on is a genre that's existed for centuries, like for sure, but arguably has been around since like the dawn of man telling stories. And this is going to be called Lost World Fantasy. Oh my God, look at it. This was extremely popular for all the way back to the times where we were just telling stories around the fire up until like authors writing detailed fantastical stories meant to be taken as fictional literature. A lot of people speculate that the popularity of this subgenre was due to the fact that the world was still a big spooky place before we explored it all. And we didn't necessarily know it was out there. If you were just some 15th century peasant working away at the fields all day and someone came along and told you a story of like some mermaids battling a giant mixed with a dragon coming in out of the ocean and a goliath coming through and stomping up that dragon. Oh, I have to edit something in to fit all that. That's gonna f And with Lost World Fantasy, we do see this historical trend of people not really even knowing for sure what is true versus false. I mean, this ties all the way back into like Greek mythology that ties into its history. It just very clearly walks this line where it blends between reality and mythology in a fascinating way. And there's a great case to be made and eventually led into instead of Lost World Fantasy, Hidden World Fantasy we see so popular today in the genre. Examples would be like Dresden Files and Harry Potter. And what's interesting about Lost World Fantasy is a lot of it wasn't specifically owned by certain authors. Granted, later on, that's no longer the case, but in especially the earliest forms of this genre, it was more just like oral tales that were passed down. And there was no like, oh, this is the creator behind it. It would just be told and retold and retold and become an element of the folklore. But before we move on from here, though, I do want to mention the tremendous role that epic poems played in the development of fantasy at this time as well. Things like Beowulf, which we aren't even sure when it was written. Between 700 to 1000 AD is when Beowulf started to to emerge is what I'll say. Epic poems kind of just from this early point on all the way through kind of now you could argue, I'm sure someone's out there doing it, has been one of the fundamental bedrocks from which fantasy has grown from. If we go back in time again, we're going to go into things like romanticism, believe it or not, follow with me here. Now a lot of people hear that and they think I'm saying like literally modern romance. New New, 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 new. I'm talking about classic romance literature. Romance in this sense is not smoochy, smoochy, squeaky, squeaky. Instead, this is think more like knights in high society, Arthurian legends, things along those lines. Think Le Mort de Arthur or even like the Vulgate cycle. I don't know if I'm saying these right. I'm dyslexic. You now, as you see with Arthurian legends, a lot of this romance style stuff was still connected to real world locations and events. They would say like, oh, this is happening out there in this map where you see it. But you would also see definitely fantasy elements strongly come into play. It's very similar to Lost World and how I'm talking about, but you'd actually see things you could actually identify as like a modern staple of fantasy. Like, oh, I don't know, dragons, wizards, magic, huh. Dark Lords, Knights, Chosen Ones. It's like, this is all stuff you can tie directly back to Arthurian legends. It's not the first time those elements appeared in literature, of course not. It's the first time they were all together in such a digestible, well-known, established story. And another big change here were these were written by specific authors. These were not cultural retellings that were just being evolved as time went on. No, these were published pieces of literature. And while they would have some things come in to change them over time, especially Arthurian stuff, that's why I don't want to just lump them in with standard romance. These basically are the first things you could argue are fantasy in some sense. The big difference here, there are prose from an author who's decided to write it in a certain way and it does not belong to the people, it belongs to that person. And yeah, Arthurian legends are here, but they're just not that easy to lump in because of how huge they became and the retellings and the recountings and the blending with real history. I just don't think it's safe 
for me to say in this video. That's just a part of it. Don't think about it. Let's go. And with the success of Arthurian legends, a lot of things sprung on out from here that you can directly tie to being the fantasy genre as a whole. Similar works that can fall into, like they have fantasy elements, but they're not gonna be labeled fantasy include The Fairy Queen, which has an evil sorceress and obviously is titled The Fairy Queen, and Amadis de Gala, which was published in around, well, we know before 1508, because we have a copy that exists from all the way back then, and that one has an evil wizard. Now, The Fairy Queen was published in 1590, and that's getting to the point where there is a heavy enough influence of fantasy that the genre is really taking form. And as we're talking about roots, I am going to be mentioning stories here that don't necessarily have fantastical elements in them, but were clear inspirations for works later on that we are calling fantasy, so that's why I must take a little bit of a, a note here, even though by any stretch of the imagination, some of the stuff I'm talking about is not fantasy. Hell, Three Musketeers played a f***ing huge role in the founding of a lot of fantasy, but it's not exactly what I would call high fantasy. Now, as we move into the Age of Enlightenment, unsurprisingly, this was a huge time for the development of the genre. Now, I do want to also take a little special note here. Let's take a knee and talk about this because it's going to be a little bit of like a hi. So you're used to being bullied because you've been in the fantasy genre for a minute. Well, guess what? That started all the way back in the Age of Enlightenment. Written snobbery towards fantastical works. Definitely like, oh, it's not this more realistic, harsh take. And man, you're just writing little fantasy blah blah blahs and flu flowers they're not worth your time. <laughs> and of course during this time we also saw the rise of the gothic genre, which was tremendous, of course, in today's influences for fantasy, specifically, of course, when looking at paranormal or urban fantasy. And I actually did a little bit of extra research here to find out, like, what was the first crucial work for gothic literature in this sense? Because this, undeniably, has been a foundational element to many important works within fantasy today. And the earliest I could find was called The Castle of Ontrent. Tyrio dyslexia? The Castle of Otranto. I was close. But it's safe to say the most iconic gothic work of all time and the most influential for the genre of fantasy as a whole is probably Bram Stoker's Dracula. Bram Stoker invented one of the most iconic creatures of all time, a vampire. It's never actually totally fallen out of popularity. The gothic genre remains strong to this day. At the turn of the 1800, we actually saw a pretty huge resurgence of fairy tale fantasy. Something that, of course, we see up into this day playing a huge part and what we consider the genre. Stop! We can't just move past from that. Fairy tales have an extraordinary importance in terms of the development of fantasy at this point in time, and we need to get into exactly how. Let's touch on two specific instances here. First, obviously, Brothers Grimm. These were two German academics who decided to take many of the popular German folk tales they were familiar with and transform them into commercially sellable prose written stories. And they did this in two volumes that are the most important we're going to talk about here today, titled Children's and Household Tales, published in 1812 and 1815. This was an absolutely seminal moment for the development of fantasy. And in the context of this video, you can see it's a real change up from when we have these just like general legends that are floating around and turning them into these actually written by an author stories for people to immerse themselves in and written in a way to try and engage a reader. There's that really important shift. It's no longer this, oh, just the loose fabrication of whatever it might be. No, this is a here is the legend written down for you and it almost becomes like the interpretation of the legend. And just a couple decades later, we had Hans Christian Andersen putting out fairy tales told for children, which as you can see, yes, the fantasy fairy tale folklore thing being for children vibe was still strong, but again, a definite shift and basically just a confirmation of what Brothers Grimm are already doing. This was the direction these type of stories were going to go in from here on out. So we have Undyne and Sintram and his champions coming into popularity fantasy is well known. We have authors writing it, whether it's with fairy tale elements, medieval elements, there are prose, it's published, it's clear and safe to say we are in the fantasy genre, just not by what any means people would consider modern fantasy of the Western genre. I need to make sure to make that clear. So this inevitably begs the question, what was the first novel published, which is distinctly first and foremost thought of as a fantasy work? Well, that's a little bit contested, but I think there's a clearer answer than a lot of people say. Frequently, you'll hear brought up The Wood Beyond the World by William Morris, published in 1894, but I don't think that's the right answer. In fact, there's one book published just a couple decades earlier by George MacDonald called The Princess and the Goblin. Now, this is still in the time when fantasy like this was written for children, and so these books are definitely that. But don't let that affect your view of these books as anything but the monuments within the genre they 
are. Their publication is what finally helped really cement the genre of fantasy as something to critically be respected and looked at. And we also, during this time, get a specific essay from Georgie Boy written about the fantasy genre, foundationally talking about the genre in a critical sense. Hells yes, thank you. Now, why do I bring up George a couple times? Well, because both C.S. Lewis and Tolkien have him written down as a major influence, so you know. Yeah. Now, I've been trying to take great efforts to make sure in this video nothing seems like it's coming across, it's just happening on a dime. There's no one individual work that can be credited with just starting fantasy. It's a slow blending and melding of almost everything I've talked about up until this point, and even after the real modern recognizable fantasy genre takes form, it wasn't just suddenly universally called that. Up until the publication of The Hobbit, it was still being labeled as fairy tales or all kinds of different things. But as time progressed, the term fantasy began began to emerge. It found popularity in various magazines and other publications talking about these works, and then the label started to stick. No, it didn't have one solid day where I can say the fantasy genre starts here with its label, but that's just how history works. It's more of a, well, as the doctor says, more like a big ball of wibbly-wobbly, timey-wimey stuff. And now let's go ahead and talk about Tolkien. He's the big boy in the room when it comes to modern fantasy, and now we are definitely distinctly transitioning into that. Tolkien's influence can be over and understated easily. He's someone who definitely reshaped and reformed the genre, but he didn't do anything that was wholly original. In fact, George MacDonald, the man Tolkien credits for being one of his greatest influences, even wrote an adult-aimed fantasy book called Fantastus. And what's kind of beautiful about all of this is that story was heavily inspired by German romantic showing how this is constantly pulling from what came before to evolve and turn into something new. And Fantastus created its own new original world with self-contained rules and ideas, something that Tolkien obviously then did with Lord of the Rings. But what Hobbit and Lord of the Rings did was just absolutely explode in commercial viability far beyond what anyone thought could be attained up into that point, especially when it came to getting literary respect. So while Tolkien didn't do something entirely new for the genre, he just did what was expected and pulled it all together so well and cemented it in the mainstream audience so firmly that from there, fantasy finally had its mainstream reputation. I also want to give a slight tip of the hat to Chronicles of Narnia here. It would be a huge disservice to not at least acknowledge C.S. Lewis was also doing something similar in terms of bringing a lot of what was going on in fantasy together and pushing it forward. He just didn't have as monumental a step as our boy Tolk Tolks. But a clear distinction between these two is that while C.S. Lewis was more leaning into the church influence on fantasy, Tolkien was pulling away from it. While there are undoubtedly Christian themes within Lord of the Rings and The Hobbit, they are not the focal point and it is not meant to be an allegory for religion. And this was the kickoff for the state of the genre we would see for decades and decades to come. It's often said that we did sit through decades of Tolkien clones, I myself have said that many times, and it's true, but we also saw many authors who did come out and publish works that were different enough to be respectable and stand on their own as distinct evolutions of the genre. And there's two final things I want to mention before we really get into the closing thoughts of this video. The first of which is the amazing role that magazines actually played in the development and cementing of what fantasy is for our pop culture. For decades, these publications like Weird Tales just helped progress and further the solidification of what sci-fi and fantasy were for what we have today. Classics like Conan, Doc Savage, John Carter of Mars all got their start in magazines like this. It may be labeled pulp, but that doesn't mean you should dismiss it. It's still crucial into how we look at fantasy now. And the second point I want to hit on ties more directly back into the first bit I spoke on here in the video, the more meta point I'm trying to get across. And that's to do with folklore and mythology. A lot of people like to dismiss this as if it's somehow gone away. I disagree. No, this is actually still a part of our collective psychology, no doubt. Hell, even in recent years, we've seen new mythical creatures brought forth and talked about. No matter how much we progress as a species, we're still gonna craft things like Slender Man. We collectively crave something fantastical like this, whether we're telling it like it's in our own world or completely fictional. And people still believe in this stuff to this day. We may now laugh at the people who actually spend millions of dollars going to look for Atlantis and El Dorado, but there's still people doing it. And I think there 
there always will be because there's something inside of us that craves the fantastic. I, I, I genuinely believe that to my core. Over the coming decades, we would also see sci fantasy become more and more popular, which in the 60s exploded in popularity for a very obvious reason. And now we have this Venn diagram of science fiction and fantasy where they overlap and more and more often we're just going to be seeing stuff published in the sci fantasy label as well, where authors kind of take from best of both worlds. But the final thing I really want to hit on though is something I talk about frequently here on the channel, and it's the impact of the self publishing boom on fantasy. Because I absolutely believe this will be looked back on as as big an impact as Tolkien had. We are seeing suddenly the gates open and anyone can be published and find mega success within the fantasy genre, regardless of whether what they have is proven to be commercially viable to this point. Hell, Tolkien was kind of this like miracle that changed up the publishing houses and they needed something that big to prove you could actually sell fantasy in this way, but they weren't eager to continue to explore what different kinds of fantasy would work. So instead, that's why Tolkien clones were what was pushed at us so aggressively. But then, anyone can find success in eyes. And from there, we see a lot of people who are clearly influenced by Western fantasy and Tolkien, but taking from fantasy around the world and taking it and putting it in what is published here in Western fantasy. People who think of just like medieval fantasy being fantasy are almost like outdated and quaint when we have so many of the best sellers topping the list are these amazing hybrids of various cultures around the world. I do want to go ahead and hit on the fact that I believe this is why several fantasy books that did this well before it became commonplace feel like they're just still new to read to this day, at least in their world building aspect. Whether it's Dune or Wheel of Time, if authors were taking the time in their world building and development to look across the world to pull in as many cultures as possible, they have an advantage over almost every other fantasy book published around their time because now the direction of that genre is steering towards their efforts. I mean, hell, you can go all the way back to Tolkien and show that he's pulling from various real life cultures, but Robert Jordan did it very apparently and showed it proudly in his pages in a way that was just not common. I'm aware I just brought up Dune, which people are gonna say that's science fiction. It's sci-fantasy. Which, sci-fantasy is such actually a huge genre to get into in terms of its history, so look for a video on that in the future as well. While the fantasy genre has evolved and changed and crazy amazing ways throughout all the years, there are still a few core elements you can trace all the way back to us sitting around a campfire telling stories to each other. And it's this sense of wonder of the possible, the unexplored, the unknown, or the ability to transport oneself to a brand new world and explore something new in that sense. Whether it's an actual portal fantasy where the character does exactly that, or just putting yourself in a character who lives in something as whimsical as the Shire. While the genre continues to shift and mold what's popular, I believe the true potential is only limited by our own imaginations. And that's the point of fantasy. It's a genre that just over overlaps others. You can take any story, and then if you need to go further, add fantastical elements to do such. And that's the real beauty of it to me. I know this was a very brief, broad strokes overview, but it's one that I thought was kind of important for my audience to have at least an awareness of. The roots of the genre are kind of spread into our human psyche in certain ways, and that's why I find it so fascinating to see it changing in the day we live in now. Anyway guys, like and subscribe if you have not already. Hit the Patreon if you want to support what I do here, and have a good one, y'all. Peace. And of course, I'd like to record a special shout out to my two latest high tier Patreons, Gregory Jenks and Gerald Alendez. Thank you guys so much.